Good morning, church. We're glad you're with us. Let's stand together as you're able and begin our time together this morning as we sing a Raise a Hallelujah. I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah louder than
Amen. Amen, church. Please be seated. Well, good morning. My name is Matt Archibald, and I'm the worship pastor here at Community Church. And boy, are we glad that you're with us this morning to worship. I was actually gone last Sunday, and if you're new this morning, uh, that's my position here as a worship pastor. But I'll tell you what, I actually really missed being here on a Sunday morning. And that's, that there, there's something unique about when the people of God worship together, but I just really miss out on that. When, and, and it's this congregation in particular that's a real blessing to me, I know to other staff here. So if this is the first time you've been here, you got to know this is a really unique and beautiful place to be a part of. And we want to get to know you, we want to get to know your story. And if you're here with us for the first time, we're better because you're with us. We want to hear your story. After the service in the lobby, find someone with a silver name tag to greet Find them, they want to get to know your story, they want to find out how you can be plugged in here to this congregation, because this is a really unique and wonderful congregation to be a part of, and I love leading worship with you and being a part of all this together. Well, church, today we were supposed to have our block party just outside, and the rain just said, nope, that's not going to happen. So we actually rescheduled that for uh, July 31st and just a couple Sundays. We're going to celebrate again. We do have kids camp coming up this week. But on the 31st, we're going to have our block party. We're still going to have food trucks. We're going to have everything that we we're supposed to have this morning. But it's just been pushed off for two weeks. So if you came today expecting to get some, some pizza and some Chomps food truck, I'm sorry. That's not going to happen. I don't want to stop you from getting pizza. So still get that after the service if you want. It's just not going to be here. Well, church, this morning, uh, sometimes we, what, uh, something we do as a congregation is I love to give you a chance to greet each other. And we're going to do that this morning. So as you stand together again, once you find somebody that maybe you don't recognize or someone you do recognize and ask them, what was the best part of your last week? So go ahead and stand and greet one another this morning and ask that question. Church, let's continue in worship now. Let's just sing the song that was just introduced last week called Blessed. Blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are the ones in need. For every thirst and every hunger, you are everything. Blessed are the worn and weary, blessed are the to grieve in every moment unexpected you are everything to seek you is to find you and to know you is to want you and I want nothing more than you to see you is to love you and I can't believe
Remind us last week as she was leading worship that the blessing is Jesus, that Jesus could not give him more than himself for us to be satisfied. And at the end of the day, that if we are satisfied in anything less than Jesus, that that satisfaction will, will flow and it will end and it will no longer be. But that when we run to Jesus, we have more than we could ever imagine or hope or want. That Jesus is the end of that satisfaction. So when we come to Jesus, we want Jesus, not the blessings of Jesus, not the things of Jesus, but Jesus himself. And that that should keep us coming back again and again and again to see how sweet he is. That the sweeter he is, that the longer we serve him, the sweeter he grows. That this Jesus is all that we need. And so as a church, we value that supremely. We value centering ourselves on Jesus and out of our love for Jesus, out of our commitment to Jesus, flows generosity, flows love for others, flows our compassion, flows grace. And one of the ways that we express that is by giving to the Lord, by saying, Lord, I trust you. Jesus, you are all that I need. You are more than enough. And out of that, I'm going to give and see what you can do with what I give to you, Lord. So as a church, we do give uh, as a part of this church. And so you can do so online. We have an app you can give through. Or if you've come this morning, there are envelopes in the seats next to you. And we have boxes outside of our sanctuary. But again, Jesus is the blessing. And he invites us to come and say, learn from me, walk with me, work with me. Watch how I do this. For I am the blessing and from me you will receive all blessings and 10,000 beside that. So let's sing this chorus together again. Sing to seek you is to find you. Seek you is to find you. And to know you is to want you And I want nothing more than you To see you is to love you And I can't believe I get to And I want nothing more than you To seek you is to find you and to know you is to want And I want nothing more than you To see you is to love you And I can't believe I get to And I want nothing more than you And I want nothing more than you Good morning. 
My name is Jason, one of the pastors here at Community Church, and I am really glad that you're here this morning, wherever you are in your walk with Christ. I am really glad that you're here. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you. We thank you for your goodness to us. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your word. We're thankful that it's true. We're thankful, Lord, that in a world that is full of conflict, of rage, of contempt, that you bring peace. You give us a peace that we cannot fully understand, but yet we can experience it. So as we sit under the authority of your word this morning, pray that my words are clear, that they're helpful, that they bring you glory and honor. Ask that uh, you would be with us here in this place and you would be with churches all around the world that are preaching the gospel. We pray especially for those who are in the midst of conflict, in the midst of persecution. Would you pour out a special measure of your grace and your protection this morning. Guide us, Lord, give us open ears to hear and open minds to receive what you have for us this morning. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Back in 1992, there was a war in Bosnia. And in the middle of that war, 22 people were killed waiting in line for bread. And in the midst of that, one heroic peacemaker stepped into the rubble, the cellist, Vedran Smilovic. And for 22 straight days, the cellist played the adagio in G minor, beautifully, poignantly honoring those who had been killed and bringing peace in the midst of fire. Friends, today as we continue our series, I believe we have a vivid picture of peace in the midst of the fire of whatever conflict we may be experiencing. I would ask you this morning, what are the conflicts, what are the fires that God has put you into? What do those look like for you? Last year we talked about complications, or last week we talked about things that are complicated. I'm going to ratchet that up a notch, and I'm going to talk about the fire of conflict. What is that for you? Is it, perhaps it's in your family, perhaps it's in your neighborhood, perhaps it's in your place of work. Maybe you have eyes to see into a world, into a community where the conflicts continue to rage and you are called to represent Christ in the middle of that. So how do you become the type of person how do I become, how do we become the type of person who can step into the conflict, who can step into the fire and bring peace? And why would you do that in the first place? So this morning we're going to return to the Beatitudes, we're going to look at some of these verses, and we're going to focus on a couple in particular that have to do with conflict. But as you think about what you bring into the fire, let me ask you, what is it that you bring? Do you bring the peace into the fire? A few years ago, Kim and I were uh, cooking in the kitchen, and we had a fire. Not just any fire, but a grease fire. What do you not put on a grease fire? 
correct answer is water. If you, didn't, if you learn one thing today, don't put water on a grease fire. Well, in the midst of the conflict, we put water on the grease fire and... <laughs> the house didn't burn down, but we had significant repair work to do. Always fun when your DIY projects are not advancing things, but just returning them. Weird smells, you can't just paint over all that stuff, so it's another story. But do you bring the right thing into the conflict? Do you bring the peace of Christ into the conflict? Well, let me take you to Matthew 5, verse 3, and we're going to review the Beatitudes, and then we'll, uh, we'll dig in and we'll talk about the, the why of what it means to be a peacemaker, what it means to to step into that conflict, whether it's making peace or enduring persecution. We'll do a little bit about the how as well, too. So Matthew 5, verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven for the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you is that echo going to work give me a thumbs up if you're hearing me okay and you're not distracted this is not an object lesson in how to respond to in a conflicted situation here i just want to make sure we're good all right thumbs up if we're good all right because I can be loud without a microphone, but we won't, we won't go there this day, this morning. So let's review a little bit. As we, as we have gone into this series, the basic idea is that there is a better way to the good life. Now, the, while the world has lots of things to offer, while the world will say that uh, there is health, wealth, and prosperity, and all kinds of things, a life of comfort, a life of ease, all these things may be the good life, we believe that Jesus offers us a better way, a different way to the good life. A couple statements, a couple takeaways from our last two weeks, I'll just review those with you. Week one, we said the better way to the good life is found in pursuing God's kingdom, not yours. So there's a laying aside that needs to take place. And then last week, we we put a few things together, and we said this, that you know, the, the better way is when we pursue the high standards of Jesus, the high standards of Jesus with the humble posture and the heart-level presence of one forgiven and loved by Jesus. So that's the groundwork we've laid. This morning, we're going to dive into what it means to be a peacemaker and to suffer persecution and respond to that conflict. And how do we become the type of person who responds as Jesus would have us respond? So let's begin with the purpose. Let's begin with the why. The why always matters. You can get all kinds of techniques in the world, but if you don't have a good why, if you don't have a good purpose, it's just technique. I can give you 15 ways to resolve conflict and all that, but if there's not a heart level why, it just goes in one ear and out the other. So let's get a good why. Let's, let's solidify that. Our purpose. Let me go back to 9 and 10. Our blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. I want you to see this morning this description between, or this connection between the description, the type of value represented in the kingdom, and the promise. 
Because what we see is that both with the peacemaker and the persecuted, there's a, there's a connection to who you are. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called what? Children of God. That's identity. That's who you are. Blessed are you when you're persecuted for righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Again, it's an identity. It's who you are. It's who you are. How you respond to the fire reveals who you are, what you're called, what you value. It's the true test. It's the true test. How we respond in the fire of conflict reveals who we truly are. Let's build a theological foundation. Let me take you to Romans 5.1. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of of God. There's a reality, there's an understanding of our relationship with God that matters here. That matters here. Let's build that foundation first this morning. Before we put our faith and trust in Christ, we are at war with God. Our sin separates us from God. That's the reality of our condition. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He brought about reconciliation so that we could become children of God. When when Jesus died on the cross, that's what he brought, reconciliation. When we think about the gospel, when we think about the good news, the declaration of victory over sin and death, the good news that says when you put your faith and trust in Christ, You're saved, that Jesus paid that penalty, that he rescued you, and he brought about reconciliation. The gospel's like a diamond. There are many facets of it. We can talk legally about how we are justified, how we are declared righteous. Now, it's not our righteousness. it's It's a righteousness from the outside. It's a covering that says, When Jesus looks at us, it's not our sin he sees, but the righteousness of Christ. And we can say amen to that. We we think about how we are adopted into the family. Another facet of that diamond. And And part of that adoption is we are reconciled. Where we were distant from God, we are now brought close to God. And that happens through faith. And how do we live this out? Paul goes on and says this in Romans 5, 3. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. That's the promise. So how do you look at the conflict that you've been given? What's the why here? How do you, how do you respond? I don't know too many people that just love running into conflict. But there's a why behind it that says there is purpose to the suffering. Paul says this in Ephesians 6 verse 14. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist with the breastplate of righteousness in place and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. This is part of that full armor of God. Have you ever felt like you're just under attack? Like, why is this happening to me today? And the evil one somehow is getting a wedge in there or there's some persecution, there's some, some heat from the outside, there's some conflict from within. Maybe it's even somebody you're like really, really close with. 
And we talk about the full armor, you know, we talk about the helmet of salvation and the breastplate of righteousness and the sword of the Spirit. But there's these shoes that are fitted with the readiness of the gospel of peace. That's a beautiful part of that armor because there's a readiness that comes that says, I will bring the gospel into the fire. There's a readiness there. Now, this phrase, it's really interesting. It goes all the way back. Let me, let, me, let me give you a little Old Testament. Let's take a left. Let's go back to the prophet Isaiah chapter 52, beginning in verse 4. For this is what the sovereign Lord says. At first, my people went down to Egypt to live. Lately, Assyria has oppressed them. And now what do I have here, declares the Lord. For my people have been taken away for nothing, and those who rule them mock, declares the Lord. And all day long my name is constantly blasphemed. Therefore my people will know my name. Therefore in that day they will know that it is I who foretold it. Yes, it is I. Now watch this. How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who proclaim the good news, who proclaim peace, who bring good tidings, who proclaim salvation, who say to Zion, your God reigns. Big story of the Bible is God bringing about the gospel of peace, of bringing peace, of bringing hope. The Old Testament looks forward to this ultimate fulfillment that's found in Jesus. But this bringing of peace, that's what God's been about. Now let's dive in a little bit more. 2 Corinthians 5.18 all this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. That's what we're called to do. When we, when we receive that peace, when we are reconciled to God, what's your response? What's our response? It is to be an ambassador. It is to, it is to represent Christ, to say, I am a child of God. My identity is in Christ. I am of God's kingdom. Amen? Amen? I don't ever forget that. I don't ever lose that fundamental identity. I don't ever lose that sense of this is who I am. And I am called to a world to bring reconciliation, to bring the hope of Jesus, to share that hope, and to be an ambassador. That's the call, to bring that peace. So much of the time when we think about peacemakers and we think about uh, resolving conflict, it's just, I just... I don't want any problems. I just want to remove conflict. I believe our call is more than that. It is to bring peace. And it is to bring the peace of Christ. So our why, and I'll sum it up this way, our purpose is to run into the fire with the gospel of peace for the one who ran into the fire for you. To run into the fire with the gospel of peace for the one who ran into the fire for you. Now we do that with a particular posture. What's our attitude? What's our mindset? We take you to, uh, to 1 Peter. Peter, not exactly known for his humility and his peacemaking early on. When the guards came to arrest Jesus, what did Peter do? Let me be a peacemaker. Here's my sword. Show me your ear. If he'd have been a better swordsman, other things, maybe the head would have come off. I don't know. He was a fisherman, not a swordsman. But this is what Peter says. 1 Peter chapter 3. Finally, all of you be like-minded and be sympathetic. Now, he's writing in a particular context where he's writing to the church that's been scattered. He says, I'm writing to you as exiles. The church has been scattered. There's other forms of government that, that, that the, the powers that be in the world are not 
It's not the church. It's not Christ. It's, it's the kingdom. He says this, finally, all of you, be like-minded, be sympathetic, love one another, be compassionate and humble. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, repay evil with blessing, because to this you were called so that you may inherit a blessing. Then he's going to quote Psalm 34, for whoever would love life and see good days must keep their tongue from evil and their lips from deceitful speech. They must turn from evil and do good. They must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Do you have a natural inclination for peace, or are you one who likes to fight? I imagine this transformation process that went on in Peter's life. How did he go from slice off the ear to this ambassador for peace? Now, don't confuse being an ambassador with just being like soft. There's tremendous courage in being an ambassador. There's a tremendous courage in standing up to whatever persecution you may face. But what is the, what is the posture? How did he get there? love what Paul says in uh, Colossians 3.15. He says, Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. And be thankful. And be thankful. There's a posture, there's an attitude of not only humility, but thankfulness. Gratitude? You talk about a counter-cultural posture. This fire of conflict has come into my life. This fire of persecution has come into my life. I'm going to be thankful. James would say, consider it pure joy whenever you face trials. I mean, how, how, do, how do we have this mindset? How do we have this posture of, humility and gratitude to run into the fire of conflict. Well, we need a plan. We need a plan. Let's talk about that plan. We need a plan. Peter continues, 1 Peter 3, 13. Who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good. But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. Now, let's get a plan. We've got a purpose. We've got a why. And and, and before you get a plan, you've got to have a purpose. But let's get this plan. How do you prepare? How do you become? How do I become? How do we become the type of person? We don't have to get out the cello and go into the middle of a war. But how do we become the type of person who that's just what you do? You run into the fire of conflict with the peace of Christ. Let me ask you this morning, do you have a vision for that? Do you want to be known for that? Is something, that's something you see as, this is what I want to be. This is what God is calling me to. I'm the type of person who when that conflict is there, oh, thank you then. He's here. Thank you that she's here. They have brought the peace of Christ into the situation. How do you become that type of person? How do you prepare for that? I want to give you two very practical steps in this, two parts of the process. Number one, attach to God and wise people. Attach to God and wise people. Last week we talked about 
trying to go in a little bit deeper and trying to have a heart-level presence with God. If you go into a conflict without that heart-level presence, who are you relying on? That's just you. That's just you. That's just your strength. So do you have those daily practices? I heard from some people that said, yeah, they set their alarm. They had a morning alarm and, a, and, and an afternoon alarm. Say, remember to pause. Remember to connect with God. Remember to pray that prayer. I, I love it when people grab those prayer cards and say, this is a practical way I can pray because we get caught up in the shallows of life. We get caught up in all the minutia, all the little things that distract us and, and call for our attention. But the first part is to attach to God and God's people. And I'm going to say wise people. Do you have wise people in your life? Or do you have people who are just going to throw water on the grease fire? Do you have some wise people who can say, hey, let me, let me help you think this through. Let's go to Jesus. To, you know, we can actually think with God. You know, I grew up with the phrase, you know, to have a personal relationship with God. It's, it's a beautiful thing. I mean, that's, that's part of this doctrine of adoption, part of this being a child of God, and that's a wonderful phrase. Sometimes people have a hard time wrapping their mind about what does that even mean? What's it mean to have a personal relationship? I can be with God. I can actually think with God in the midst of my conflict. While the rubble, while the battle's raging, as a follower of Jesus, I can be with God. I can think with God. I can hear from God in the middle of all that. That is available to you. That is available to you today. If we would listen, if we would attach. Say, God, help me think this through. Bring people into my life who can help me think this through. Have you ever gone into a meeting and say, Lord, shut my mouth when it needs shut? Open it when I need to speak? Help me to tell the difference? One of the beautiful truths of our faith is that, that God has given us the Holy Spirit to guide us, to direct us, to actually help us think. So there's the attachment part. Attached to God and his people, I, I need to know who God is, I need the word, I need to pray, I need to invite the Spirit, I need to attach. I like being attached to God. If this morning you've never made that commitment, you've never said, Lord, I, I, I trust you. I don't have it all figured out, but I believe you died on that cross. I believe you rose from the dead. And I'm going to trust in you for my salvation. I'm ready to stop going the way of the world and turn around and simply pray in simple faith. Even if I've got doubts, I can say, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. You can pray that prayer today and you can have a relationship with God. You, you can think with God. You don't have to be on your own. You can do that today. You can do that today. There's another part to this, though. Attaching to God is fun. I like that. But we also need to detach from our pride. We need to detach from our pride. So if, if we're going to be the type of people, the type of men and women and kids who can step into the fire of conflict, we have to have an attachment to God and we need to detach from our pride. So let's take a, take a moment as the rain, what a, what a wise call to postpone. <laughs> Thanks to Pastor Brad for making that wise call on that. 
But let's deal with our pride. Let's do that together. Let's think with God in the moment here, and let's deal with our pride. I got pride issues, and they're kind of like weeds. They keep cropping up. I can even put the strongest weed kill on them, and they tend to kind of come back up. Let's talk about pride. Let's talk about detaching from pride. Last week I gave you a little Dallas Willard about how grace is not opposed to effort, it's opposed to earning, and grace is an attitude, effort is an action. A little Dallas Willard story for you. Uh, he was a USC, that's University of Southern California, picture wise philosophy professor at USC. Not exactly the bastion of Christianity, not a powerhouse in the Christian world. I never liked USC as when they played football. I didn't like that. I was rooted against them, right? For the Big Ten. But anyway, here Willard is at USC. He's a believer. He's teaching philosophy at USC. Nature of truth, all these heady things. And one of his students is just going after him. I mean, he's, he's ripping Willard. He's saying this. He's calling him names. He's saying how his thinking is idiotic. This is the, this is the professor of the philosophy department. And Willard calmly says, there's probably 10, 15 minutes left to go in the class, and he simply says, all right, I believe this is a good time to end class. Have a good weekend. Stops. One of his students in the classroom, a Christ follower, can you be a Christ follower at a secular university? Yes. Can you teach at a secular university and be a follower of Jesus? Yes. God calls all people different, different places but a student comes up to him and says, Professor Willard, why did you not just respond and tear that guy up? And he said this. He says, I am practicing the discipline of not having to have the last word. I am practicing the discipline of not having to have the last word. Now, I've got about a hundredth of the intellect of Dallas Willard, and I think that's really hard. I can't imagine. What an example, though. Now, Willard gives us three questions to reveal pride in our lives. The first one, where am I presuming? Where am I presuming? What's it mean to presume? It's the pre is in front of it. Prior to engagement, prior to relationship, prior to the conversation I ought to have, I am making assumptions. I am prejudging. I have the right lens to the situation. I have the right framework. If you all would sit at my feet, I could guide you. I see more clearly than anyone else. Prior to even hearing your perspective, that's what it means to presume. Are there areas in your life where you are presuming? The second one, where am I pretending? Where am I pretending? Where am I putting on a show? Where am I pretending like I have it all together? Where am I pretending like the situation, the conflict is better than it really is. Where am I saying, oh, fine, no big deal, when it, there's really something there that we need to deal with? Where am I pretending that the conflict is worse than it actually is because there's something to be gained on my behalf? Try that one on. Where am I pretending? Where am I pushing? Where, where do I worry and hurry? Where, I, where am I pressing my agenda over God's agenda? Where do I need to give up my right to be right, even if I am right? Let me say that one more time. Where do I need to give up my right to be right, even if I am right?
I want those questions to sit on you for a moment because I believe we've all been called into some fire of conflict, into some fire where our values as followers of Jesus may not always be welcome, where we are in the middle of a conflict, where we may be an agent of reconciliation. But whatever the case, if we are going to bring peace, we need to attach to God and we need to detach from our pride. I'm not going to let you go yet. We're going to come to the communion table. Just leave the, leave the elements to the side for a moment. And I want, us to, I want us to prepare our hearts and our minds for the table this morning. Because really, communion is a time of examination. It's a time first to confess our pride. Last night I got a text from Pastor Steve, my predecessor here, good friend, we still stay in touch, and he sent me this quote from Martin Luther. And that, if you know Steve, that's just Steve, just random. Here it is. I said, well, thanks for this. Listen to this quote from Luther. The sin underneath all our sins is to trust the lie of the serpent that we cannot trust the love and grace of Christ and take matters into our own hands. Let me read that again. The sin underneath our sin, all our sin, is to trust the lie of the serpent that we cannot trust the love and grace of Christ and take matters into our own hands. So before we receive the bread and the cup, I would invite you to do this. Put, put the elements aside for a minute. There's this image, and when I think of pride, I always think that there's a clinching. There's a hanging on. So I'd invite you to simply bow your head. And I would invite you, if you're willing, to, to hold out your hands and simply make a fist. Clench it tight. Clench it tight, not, not loosely. I want you to feel that clench. I want you to feel the pride that you're clinging on to, whether it's the ways that you presume, the ways that you pretend, the ways that you push. I want you to feel those. I want you to feel the weight of that. Allow the Spirit in these moments to show you what that might be. Maybe there's something you haven't even thought about before you walked in here today. But there's something in your heart right now that you're clinging on to. And then before we come to the table, I would simply ask you to just pray to the Lord yourself right now and just say, Lord, take this from me. I give my pride to you. And as you do that, and if that's the desire of your heart, I want you to simply release your hands and turn those over release that to the Lord. And having done that, I would invite you now to take out the bread and the cup, and I would invite you to put the, the bread in your hand and the cup in the other. When we come to the table, we come as followers of Jesus. We don't have to have it all figured out, but we come ready to receive grace. We come ready to receive grace, and we, we're reminded 
that on the night Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and after giving thanks, he broke it and he gave it to his disciples. He said, this is my body given for you. Take ye, do this in remembrance of me. So as followers of Jesus, may we now receive the bread. In the same way, Jesus took the cup. He says, this represents my blood, blood shed, the blood of the new covenant, blood shed for the forgiveness of sins. So just as we receive the bread, may we now, together, as followers of Jesus, receive the cup. Would you pray with me now? Father, as we come to you, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your grace we thank you that you have made a way for us to be reconciled to have peace with you may we now as your spirit leads us may we draw near to you may we release the pride that we need to so that we can be your representatives to a world who needs your hope it's in jesus name that we pray amen well, church, let's stand together once again as we close this morning singing together the song Good Grace.
this blessing now from the words of Jesus himself, John 14, 27. He says, my peace, my peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. May we leave this place recipients of that peace and may we share that peace, share that hope with a world that desperately Go now in peace. See me for a prayer card on your way out.